Good morning. How you doing? Buenos dias. What other languages have we got? Let's hear it. Louder. Bonjour. What other languages have we got? Let's hear it. Konnichiwa. How many is that? Four. What else have we got? Wait. Let's hear it. That's five. What else we got? Wait, wait, wait. One at a time. What else we got? Chinese. Let's hear it. All right. What else we got? Let's hear it. What else we got? Swahili. Let's hear it. Eso. What else we got? Zulu. Let's hear it. Eso. What else we got? One more. Let's hear it. Excellent. We are one world and we have many languages. My name is Jim Schultz and I am genuinely honored to be here with you this morning for a couple of reasons. First of all, I have a particular affinity for your generation. I think about you a good deal for all kinds of reasons that we're going to talk about this morning. You are, in a very strange way, the, the chosen people in ways you might not fully like, but you are the chosen people because of the generation that you are. We'll talk about that. I'm also appreciative of being here with people of faith. Faith has had a... Uh, who is clicking my slides? Stop messing with my slides. Thank you. Faith has had an important role in my life. Um, I'm reasonably certain I am the only Buddhist Jew to ever run a Christian mission in Bolivia. Uh, that confusing story is for another day. Let me just say a quick word about the Democracy Center, the organization that I founded in 1992 and have run as executive director since then. Um, how many freshmen here? Raise your hand. Oh, lots of you. Any sophomores? All right. Um, the Democracy Center was born in my head the summer between my sophomore and junior years in college at UC Berkeley. I was a political activist and I thought I had scored a truly awesome summer internship in the office of the powerful Speaker of the Assembly at the California State Capitol. And it was a great internship and it was also a summer of profound disillusion on my part because I guess I thought it was going to be like ancient Greece or something, you know, the democratic deliberation. And of course, that's not what a state capital is. That's not what politics is in this country. And I had a bit of a crisis. And one of the things that I took note of that summer was that there were all these amazing activists outside the process, making noise, trying to make their feelings known, trying to have an impact on the democratic process, and they genuinely did not have a clue about how to do that in an effective way, because they didn't understand how the inside of the process works. And somehow in my head popped this idea that there should be an organization that would help teach people on the outside how to genuinely influence what happens on the inside. And it should be called the Democracy Center. I didn't start that for quite a few years afterwards, but I, I say this to you as a cautionary tale. Be careful what crazy idea you think up between your sophomore and your junior year, because you might end up making a life out of it. And that, of course, is the beautiful thing about being a college student. Any crazy idea that comes into your head might well be your life. So pay attention to those, those crazy ideas. At the Democracy Center, our definition of democracy is this. 
that every human being has a right and a responsibility to understand the public issues around them, a right and a responsibility, and that every human being has a right and a responsibility to take action, to change the world around us in a better way. We have worked in so many diverse situations. In the early 90s, when we had the last round of historic attacks on immigrants, we were deeply embedded in the immigrant rights movement in California. We've worked with indigenous communities in Bolivia. We've worked with healthcare activists in South Africa. I do work around the world now a lot with UNICEF, um, helping them develop their strategies for children's rights. I was just in Mozambique two weeks ago, and I'll be in Macedonia at the end of this month. We have an amazing team of people. Uh, unlike me, they're not old. They're also not Americans. Uh, two Bolivians, two Brits, two Irish. Some live in Europe, some in Bolivia. They're in their mid-30s and they do stunning work and you can find out more about it on our website. I'm working on it. There we go. All right, I have a story for you. Can you see this slide? It's an old story. Some of you may have heard it. And I didn't realize until about a year ago that this actually originated with the Buddha, which of course made me more interested in it. There was a king, and he was a bit of a jerk, and he was trying to prove a point. So he said to his servants, bring me an elephant, and bring me five blind men. So the servants did what servants do. They brought him an elephant, they brought him five blind men, and the king commanded the blind men, I want you to touch this beast, and I want you to tell me what it is. So one of them grabbed the tail and said, it's like a snake, your highness. Another one grabbed its leg and says, no, it's like a giant trunk of a tree. Another one grabbed its ear and said, no, it's like a giant leaf. And then, of course, they began fighting and arguing over who was right. We all have blind spots. We all have things that we do not see because of our personal experience. I have a set of blind spots that are uh, of some note in the current national discussion. I'm white. I'm a man. I'm old, relatively speaking. I'm straight and I'm middle class. I have the full array of classic blind spots of an American male at this moment in history. I have no idea what it's like to be black in America. I have no idea what it's like to be young in America. I can only guess. I don't know what it's like to be queer in America. I don't know these things from personal experience. And so I acknowledge those blind spots at the beginning of this talk. I think it's important to do that. There are things that you see and experience, some of you, that I don't. It is also important, as we recognize our blind spots, to not lose sight of the fact that we each also have insights because of our personal experience. The three that I think I have to bring to the table are these. First of all, I have, since I was a teenager, for more than 40 years, been a political activist. I have worked on political campaigns. I have lobbied state lawmakers. I have been staff to politicians. I have engaged in protests in many different countries, well, two different countries. I have been tear gassed on the streets. I've been shot at. I've worked with people across cultures. And I think I've gotten some insight from that. The second is that I, as Linda said, lived two decades not in this country, but in a really remarkable country, Bolivia. And if you live outside your home country, especially in a place as different as Bolivia, you learn some things. Uh, as I've returned to the United States in this strange era, I'm always, I, I am again a foreigner. Um, I, I, I didn't know how to work cash machines. Uh, I fumbled with my credit card one day at a Walmart and I explained to the woman, you know, 
I I'm sorry, I don't know how anything works here anymore. I've been gone for 20 years. I was in Bolivia. And she said, is that near Russia? And I explained to her that it had been, but they moved it like a sports team. <laughs> The third insight, and this is a really strange one, is people like me tend to live in the liberal bubbles of Brooklyn or San Francisco, and I do not. I moved, of all places, to Lockport, New York. Lockport, New York is a very small, very working class town on the shores of the Erie Canal that is your classic post-industrial town. They used to have 10,000 jobs in a GM plant, and those disappeared. And I live right square in the middle of Trump land. I live in the most conservative Republican part of New York State, conservative enough that even though our Republican congressman was recently indicted, he will probably also be reelected. All of that brings me to the topic that I want to talk with you about this morning. You belong to the very first generation in human history, in 200,000 years of humanity on this planet, the very first to be born into a planetary crisis. I want you to just absorb that for a minute. That is not to say that other people in other places and other generations have not been born into phenomenal hardships and crisis. If you were an African American, if you were black in this country, born in up until the Civil War, you were born into slavery. Or if you were a Jew born in Europe in the 1930s, you were born into genocide. If you're a Syrian child born today, you're born into one of the most horrific civil wars where you have a leader who drops chemical poison on his children. But there is something very different about this crisis. Because all those other crises ultimately have an on and an off switch controlled by human beings. We can choose to end slavery, we can choose to end war. We might do everything in our power on climate change and the earth bats last. We do not have control over how our planet is going to respond. You are the very first generation in 10,000 generations of humanity to be born into a planetary crisis. Whether you like it or not, this crisis is going to shape and frame the entirety of your life. You're going to have to think about how to relate to it. You're going to have to think about how to process your relationship to that crisis in the same way that if you found out tomorrow that you had a chronic illness, you would have to figure out how you're going to process that and relate to that over a long period of time. And as I see it, you have three options. The first is you can ignore it. You can just text your way and Facebook your way through it. There, we are equipped with really excellent distractions. You can say, ah, uh, que pasa, lo que pasa. You know, I'll just stay inside and video chat with my friends if the weather's crappy. That's an option, and it is certainly, in this country, the most popular option. You can also presume that you will be able to acquire sufficient affluence to be able to shield yourself from it in the way that we can use affluence to shield ourselves in gated communities. Or you can take action. You can do something about it. You can be a part of a worldwide community and effort to do something about it. So if you belong to one of the first two groups, that your plan is either to ignore it or to try to shield yourself from it through affluence, I would like to make an apology 
because none of what I'm going to say from this point forward will be of particular interest to you. So I invite you to just hum silently to yourself until I'm done. But for the rest of you, let's talk. First of all, let's talk about the nature of the crisis upon us. We understand the science, and let's be very, very clear, there is not a scientific debate. That's long over. There's so many different ways in which we can talk about the way it's over. We can talk about the fact that NASA, who we ought to respect of having some scientific expertise, studied 12,000 peer-reviewed climate science papers and concluded that the common conclusion of those papers was that number one, global warming is real, and number two, that human activity is one of the central causes. There are still people who want to debate this. There are still people who want to pretend it was a hoax developed by scientists to get grant money. I don't engage much in those debates anymore, any more than I think it's really that advantageous to debate whether 2 plus 2 equals 4. Science is science. We understand the nature of that science. It's pretty simple. We have a planet that requires a balance. We exhale carbon, and something has to inhale that carbon. We used to not exhale very much carbon as a species. We didn't have cars and industries and for thousands and thousands of years, and there were so many forests and trees that whatever carbon was out there, the trees were able to suck it up and store it. The Industrial Revolution changed that. The deforestation of the planet changed that. And like anything that's out of balance, it has results. And so now what we have is so much carbon in the atmosphere and so many fewer forests to suck that carbon up and store it that the balance system of the planet is completely messed up. And we understand what the impacts are. The rising levels of the sea and the fact that cities like New York, San Francisco, Miami and don't even get started on Bangladesh are decades away from seeing whole parts of the cities becoming subsumed by the ocean if we don't change course. Let's talk about extreme weather. We are, once again, how many storms of the century per year do we have now? They used to be literally storms of the century. We have more storms of the century than the Buffalo Bills win football games. Sorry if there's any Bills fans here. That was a shout out to my son-in-law. What is that like? It's like taking a guy with a really violent temper and then getting him drunk on top of it. We always have had extreme weather, but when you add climate change to the mix, we get weather that is more extreme, more often. We get flooding. We get biblical level fire seasons in California. We get drought. We get heat waves. And what we are seeing right now is just the preview of coming attractions. We have entered the time in which we are no longer dealing with the theory of climate change, we are dealing with the opening act of climate change. And that should alarm you if it doesn't. Here's another reality. There is almost an indirectly inverse relationship between the amount of blame you bear for causing the crisis and the amount of impact on you. What do I mean by that? Bolivia, other poor countries, they did not contribute to this crisis by and large. Like the United States, Europe, India, China, the big countries, but all these other small countries, they didn't cause it, but that's where the impacts are going to hit. Who else didn't cause it, but is going to be hit by the impacts? You and your younger sisters and brothers, and certainly any kids that you have. Because when the science fiction stuff starts to kick in, I'll be dead, and you won't be. You'll be coming into the full flower of your adult lives and raising children. Let's talk about the impact on democracy and justice. A few years ago, 
when the immigrant crisis out of Syria and the Middle East really hit its peak and people started to pay attention, I was asked by UNICEF in the Netherlands to come and help it develop its strategy for how it would respond and try to get the government to take in more refugees and deal with them in a fair way. And I watched this interview on CNN with the Hungarian policeman with all, at the border with Greece with all these refugees coming through. And he said in this sort of big Hungarian deep voice, we have two choices. We can either let them in or we can shoot them. And we're not going to shoot them. Okay, now fast forward. What happens when we're not talking about refugees in the tens of thousands or the hundreds of thousands? What happens in 40 and 50 years or less when whole parts of the Persian Gulf become so hot and humid that it becomes impossible for human survival for more than 90 minutes outside? These are the projections that we are looking at in your lifetimes. They're not going to let them in. They're going to shoot them. Bet on it. We're not going to be debating at that point whether to build a wall with Mexico. We're going to be debating whether to put gun turrets on the wall when the rural economies of Central America collapse because of drought. These are not alarmist projections. These are projections based on where we are headed, and we need to pay attention to them. And here is the good news. It could be worse. Because what if this was happening and we didn't have a clue why it was happening or what we could do about it? But we know what's happening, and we know what to do about it. So the question is, why aren't we? This is the task before us. We have to alter the behavior of billions of people on this planet in deep ways, wicked fast. And to do that, we need to alter the choices around us. The International Panel on Climate Change just did a new report they released on Monday. And if you haven't read the news coverage of it, you should. The New York Times had a good metaphor. They said, it's like a smoke alarm going off in your kitchen in the middle of the night with the most piercing sound that you can have. Pay attention. The International Panel on Climate Change, which is a consortium of scientists all over the world that read other scientific papers, says, look, we have about 11 years left. 11 years. So if you're 19, that means we have until you're 30. We have that space of time to rapidly alter specifically our relationship to energy and fossil fuels as much as anything else, and also agriculture, the role of meat and cows and all of that in, in climate change. We have 11 years to deal with that. Otherwise, it becomes locked in in a way that there is, there is no break. There is no to way to stop it. So in that 11 years, number one, small changes are not going to be enough. Number two, voluntary action is not going to be enough. People are not just going to go, oh my gosh, I need to completely change my behavior because this is, some people will, but most people just are busy living their lives and driving their kids to school and trying to get a job and doing all these things and you think, oh, what difference is one thing I'm going to do going to make? And so we have to alter what economists call the choice architecture around us that nudges us to move ourselves around in a different way, to heat our homes in a different way, to use appliances in a different way, to do all of these things in a different way. And that requires changes in law. It requires changes in policy. And it requires one other thing. It requires one of the most valuable and significant tools that we have. And that is democracy. It is the indispensable tool. It is about our right and our responsibility to understand what's happening and our right and our responsibility to take action. And you and your generation have a profound role in this picture, an indispensable role in this picture. Why? Because one of the things that we need, and we need it now, is urgency. My generation is not dealing with this. My generation is screwing around and they are not paying attention, and it's your future that's on the line. It is your future that's on the line. 
And if your generation doesn't bring a sense of urgency to this and a demand for action, nothing is going to change. Urgency always comes from the young, and in this case it has to come from the young. And whatever it takes to build that urgency into this, it's really going to be up to you, not old people like me, to deliver it. And second, creativity. The older you get, the more set in your ways you get. The, oh, there's this way to do it, there's this way. You are young, you're creative, you're constantly thinking of different ways to do things, some of which are stupid, and some of which are phenomenally genius. So don't worry about whether they're stupid or genius. Just be creative. The world will sort out whether they're stupid or genius. But have faith in your power of creativity. If you think it's a cool idea, go with it. And it's not one specific thing. There isn't one specific way to do this. Maybe it's being a political activist. Maybe it's being an educator. Maybe it's supporting community gardens. Maybe it's being the guy who fixes people's bikes on campus. It could be anything. But here are the two qualities that I encourage you as young people to look for as you sort through this. First of all, what calls forth your passion? Because if you are not passionate about it your freshman year in college, you're not going to be passionate about it in 10 years. You have to find that thing that you are genuinely passionate about where you can't let it go. And you know what I mean. You've all found some passion in something. Find some passion in something that has to do with changing the world. And second, find the thing that you are gifted to do. Find that talent. If you find that place where your inspiration and your passion marry with your talent and your gifts, that's power. Okay, this is the pop quiz. Does anybody know who this guy is? Oh, come on. Somebody must know who this guy is. FDR. FDR. Why is he famous? He was, president. he was president of the United States. And what was going on when he was the president? The Great Depression. He started Social Security. The Great Depression. And what was the other big thing that was going on? World War II. Okay, this is what he said in the midst of all this. There's a mysterious cycle in human events. To some generations much is given, of other generations much is expected. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. You are one of those generations. You have a rendezvous with destiny. You have a rendezvous with a moment in human history. And you can either lament that or you can take some joy in the fact that you have a generational purpose that is as noble as any purpose. Which brings me to my last point. Activism is an act of faith. There is no guarantee that what you do is going to make a difference. If you think that's the way to move forward, then give it up. Ultimately, this is about acting in faith. It is about acting on the belief that if you move forward together and you do something, that you have the best chance possible of making a difference. I hope that you will act on that faith. I hope that you will think about this. And as the Dalai Lama once said at the end of a speech I heard him give in Berkeley, if what I have said to you really doesn't resonate or make much difference, then just forget about it. But if it has, do something. Thank you.